This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Back in August, I did a video on moon mining and how it's very possible that we might be doing that soon and what kind of resources we might get there and what we could do with it. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, you should, you should go watch it. It's a banger. But many of the comments in that video pointed toward a very important issue, and that issue is that we as human beings um, suck. Since the very beginning, we have taken this planet and put lines around it, and then spent countless human lives defending those lines. Sometimes we kill each other to push that line a little bit further and make our slice of the pie a little bit bigger. Sometimes it's out of petty spite and politics, but usually it's fought over resources of some kind. Oil, clean water, fertile land, minerals, gold, if it's got value, we will find a way to get it. Usually through massive amounts of human suffering. So yeah, now we're tiptoeing off this planet and we're finding resources out there in space and it, and it begs the question, you know, how are we gonna draw those lines? What comes next? And maybe the most important question, is history gonna repeat itself? All right, so if we're gonna be talking about space resources and lines, let's just start with the line that divides Earth from space. It's a line you've heard a lot about recently with the Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic launches, the Kármán line. This is usually talked about as sort of a petty, arbitrary thing, like it's what determines whether or not you get astronaut wings on the pen when you go up there. But in the terms of who owns space, it's actually pretty consequential. Consequential, but still arbitrary. It's considered the point where our atmosphere ends and space begins, and it lies at 100 kilometers above mean sea level. But if I may, well, actually myself, the Earth's atmosphere actually extends way beyond that, um, actually all the way out to the moon. It's called the geocorona. So yeah, this is just an imaginary line. Uh, it's considered the boundary between the disciplines of aeronautics and astronautics. But it's also another kind of boundary. At least, it was supposed to be. Theodore von Karman, who the line is named after, said that the 100 kilometers up is the airspace above a country. That's what that country owns. But above that, it's sort of akin to international waters. It's like you always hear about how a plane has entered another country's airspace. Well, well here's where that airspace ends. Because there's no more air. It's, it's just space. But yeah, space and the ocean are vastly different, obviously, but it's kind of helpful to think of it in that term, that, you know, space, or the area above the Kármán line, is basically international waters. But yeah, following the rules set up in the 60s to the International Space Treaty, basically satellites, planets, moons, asteroids, these are all considered common heritage. Uh, they're neutral territory, they belong to all of us. Which is a beautiful sentiment, you know, it's, it's almost Star Trekian, or... Star Trek-ish, I don't know how you're supposed to say it. Of course, in Star Trek, they also had the eugenics wars that took place in 1992, so. The treaty also prevents the use of weapons or nukes in space, which is being pushed quite a bit these days. But the point of the Outer Space Treaty was, if we are gonna go to space, we are going to go as one species. There's not gonna be a, a nationalist effort there. And this is a rule we've always abided by. Except, you know, always. But let's talk for a second about common heritage. Common heritage is the idea that there are some things that shouldn't belong to any particular country or nation or corporation. They should belong to all the people of the world. Like the human genome, for example. The human genome belongs to all of us. It doesn't belong to any country or nation or corporation. Doesn't mean some aren't trying. Looking at you, 23andMe. And there are a lot of areas on planet Earth that are considered common heritage, including the international seabed, under the international seabed, international waters above and below, and international airspace. And this was the idea behind the Outer Space Treaty, that space could be added to that list as a common heritage. But maybe because we've been learning a lot more about what resources exist out there in space, this whole idea has been withering for quite some time now. To that end, many parties to the Outer Space Treaty have been trying to alter it lately. None more so than the US of A. Because everybody having something, <laughs> that's socialist. So we passed the US Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, or because everything has to be an acronym, the Spurring Private Aerospace Competitiveness and Entrepreneurship Act. You know, if Congress spent half as much time governing as they do trying to come up with clever acronyms for things, we might actually have some kind of... This act paved the way for companies like SpaceX and Boeing to ferry crew and cargo to the International Space Station, and eventually, Boeing might actually do it. Ooh, Boeing! But part of this bill specifically addresses the use of space resources, aiming to, quote, promote the right of United States citizens to engage in commercial exploration for and commercial recovery of space resources free from harmful interference. 
So of course, hyper-capitalist United States with our hyper-capitalist president is now breaking with international common heritage treaties. Oh, no, actually, it was, it was this hyper-capitalist president. Yeah, it was signed in 2015. The American dream is dead! Now, to be fair, there was more to that quote from the bill. In accordance with international obligations of the United States and subject to authorization and continuing supervision by the federal government. So technically, these private space companies should be operating under the auspices of the international agreement, but some private space companies were working on this before the Space Act was even signed. One of those corporations is Moon Express, which has the simple mission of mining as much water on the moon as possible and selling it. Bob Richards, who owns Moon Express, referred to water as the oil of the solar system, and he's not wrong. We talked about this in various videos, but water can be used not just for drinking, but also fuel and oxygen. In the far future, as we expand out into the solar system, these resources are gonna be worth vast amounts of revenue. Which is why, in 1979, the International Space Treaty was augmented to include a provision specifically about moon resources. In the agreement governing the activities of states on the moon and other celestial bodies set forth by the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, it states this about moon resources. Quote, an equitable sharing by all states, parties, and the benefits derived from those resources, whereby the interests and needs of developing countries, as well as the efforts of those countries which have contributed either directly or indirectly to the exploration of the moon, shall be given special consideration. Now, if you find it hard to believe that the United States would sign on to a treaty uh, offering to share all the resources of the moon when we were the only people that had gotten to the moon at the time, uh, that's because we didn't sign it. We're not party to that treaty. Now, one way to look at how we'll probably approach space resources is to make it sort of analogous to the fish industry. Like, if you were a fishing vessel and you were flying your country's flag over your vessel, then you are party to that country's laws. But whatever fish you get, you get to keep. So space law is basically fish law, with a touch of the Homestead Act of 1862. Hashtag space fish. So space resources are one thing, um, space weapons are something else altogether. First of all, space warfare or any squabbles about space resources, those are still gonna be taking place down here on Earth, not up there in space. It's just too expensive to fight in space right now anyway. We can barely get a gallon of water into space cheaply, much less a moon tank. Who else wants to see a moon tank? So I suppose it's possible that as we get deeper into space resources that the US and the rest of the world will get together and decide to, you know, work together for the goodness of all mankind instead of, you know, fighting each other over it. That, that would be nice. Or we could do our own thing and just put lines in the regolith just like we did down here on Earth, which did not always work out that well. Looking at you, all the wars ever. But the trend currently is towards something that's probably even messier. And that's private corporations exploiting space resources. So now we're looking at the possibility of hyper mega corporations formed out of some kind of neo manifest destiny. Expanse much? Because international law and this kind of thing is still kind of stuck back in the Cold War space race. There's really no legal framework for how to, to regulate the exploitation of space resources by private companies. As we head back to the moon and set our sights on Mars and the asteroid belt, we're also gonna be building a legal infrastructure around all this. There's gonna be a lot of lawsuits flying around. And if lawsuits are what determines the future of space, I'd say Blue Origin has a leg up on their competition. Hey yo! Like seriously, if somebody asked me what field of law they should go into, I would say space law. It's, it's, it's gonna get crazy. By the way, one of the top schools to go to if you wanna learn air and space law is the International Institute of Air and Space Law in Leiden, the Netherlands. Just saying. So, who owns space? Nobody for now. And that's okay. For now. But as this major leap forward in space travel continues and as space resource technologies start getting proven out, we're gonna to have to have some pretty difficult discussions about who we're gonna be over the next couple hundred years as we move off this planet. Are we one people, one species? Or are we a collection of cultures and nations? Or are we just cogs in the wheels of a galactic hypercorporation? Tell me what you think in the comments. Dream but hey, if we're gonna explore and exploit the solar system, you might wanna know what's out there. So a good place to start might be the series Secrets of the Solar System on CuriosityStream. This eight part series takes you on a tour through the solar system with each episode focusing on a different planet, the asteroid belt, the sun itself, and yes, even Pluto. You'll come out the other side with a better understanding of our little corner of the galaxy than you ever had before. And if you should happen to become the head of an interplanetary resource mining corporation, you'll know where to go. You gotta be prepared for these things, you know. 
And this, of course, is just one of thousands of documentary series on Curiosity Stream from some of the best documentary filmmakers from around the world. If you like entertaining and educational content, this is the streaming service for you. Even better, with your subscription to Curiosity Stream, you get free access to Nebula, the streaming service I'm a part of, as well as many of your other favorite YouTube channels, where you can watch our videos ad-free. That means both pre-rolls and the sponsor messages, like you're hearing right now. And of course, Nebula is the only place where you can watch my six-part series, Mysteries of the Human Body, which covers all the weird and surprising ways our bodies have kept us guessing over the years. We cover everything from weird and rare diseases to common diseases we still can't cure, famous human oddities, and the question of why we age and die. We wrapped up the series last month, so it's all available to binge at your heart's desire. And you, dear viewer, can get this bundle for 26% off the normal rate, so that's like $14.79? $14.79 for two services for a full year. It's bonkers, and if you don't do it, you're crazy. I hear it makes a good gift as well for the nerd in your life. So if you're curious, head over to curiositystream.com slash joescott to get started. Big thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Patreon supporters and community members here on YouTube who are just forming an awesome community, being real cool and, and supportive, and I get lots of great ideas from them. Can't thank you guys enough. There's some new members here on YouTube to shout out real quick. We've got J.W. Hibner, Fish Sandwich, can go for a fish sandwich right now. Rob Dragon, Greg Zidison, uh, Tom Ray, Ty Helton, Wade, uh, Whale Edited Tona, Keensay, Reserva X2, Tim Weirly, Father Morpheus, Matt Dahl, Lilith Esme, Scott Radowski, uh, Richard Cox, and Joe L. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and get a little cool avatar by your name in the comments, uh, just hit the little join button down below. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, this one might be up your alley because Google seems to think so. Or you might look at any of these others that are being recommended by YouTube. Do go watch them. And um, if you like them, I recommend you subscribe because I come back with videos every Monday. All right, thanks a lot for watching. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.